Hello. Welcome to Call It Like I See It, presented by Disruption Now. I'm James Keyes, and in this episode of Call It Like I See It, we're going to take a look at the stimulus bill that was just passed by the U.S. government and consider what we can expect from it, and also if there's anything we can learn about our government from the way it was passed. And later on, we're going to wade into the timeless debate over daylight savings time and whether we still need to be out here saving daylight. Joining me today is a man who, whenever he sees Wall Street losing dough on every share, he blames it on longer hair. Tunde Ogonlana. Tunde. With all this stimulus money flying around, do you think we can still say that people make the world go around? Yeah, I'm just um, trying to figure out how to come back since I'm bald <laughs> from that comment. Uh, <laughs> it fits. <laughs> so, and then, and then I was going to say something about saving the daylight, but, you know, <laughs> thinking about saving the turtles. But, you know, all my jokes are, are, are all swimming together now in my head. You screwed me up. So let's just go. <laughs> let's, let's give the audience a good show. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now we're recording this on March 15th, 2021. And last week, we saw President Biden sign a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill into law. Now, this is the third stimulus that the U.S. government has done in the last year to try to combat the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. And recent polling suggests that these types of stimulus efforts have remained popular, very popular amongst Americans. There There are concerns about what types of effects these efforts will have over the long term. But most seem to understand that we have to survive through the short term to even have the opportunity to deal with the long term. So, Tunde, what are your general thoughts on this third stimulus bill? Like, do you think or what do you think as far as uh, what it's aimed at accomplishing? And and do you think it'll work? I do think uh, so. Let's let's back it up here on a very simple you know, way to look at it. Do I think it's going to work? I think the answer is yes, in general for um, and and. The, the the idea of will it work, I think, is broad because people can have a different opinion on the, the pieces of the stimulus. I know that everyone's okay. got an opinion about where money is being spent and how. And But I think like we saw last year with the CARES Act and the stimulus then on going back all the way to the stimulus after the great financial crisis, first with the TARP in 08 and then the, the additional stimulus when Obama took off office in early 09, I think the idea is that, remember, these these type of economic shocks, thankfully, don't happen that often. So we only have a few examples in history where the economy really either was stopped or or, or shut down or whatever, where, mm-hmm. where business and capital really came to a halt. And I'd say, you know, we can count them on five times and, you know, count them on one hand, the amount of times this has happened uh, under five times in the last hundred years. So the glaring example most people know is the Great Depression yeah. uh, from 1929 to the late 30s. And what the Federal Reserve did back then was um, tighten the money supply. So they did not print money like we see them doing in the last decade or so. And we know that the Great Depression was very painful for our society, our country. Uh, it reverberated around the world and it gave us the conditions that led to you know, authoritarian regimes in in Europe that gave us the Second World War. So I think a lot of reasons um, culminate to why the powers that be in our societies in modern day have opted for printing money. And um, and I think a lot of the downside negative effects that a lot of people have been scared of in terms of just runaway inflation, all that. I'm not saying that they can't happen. I'm just saying to this point over the last 12 years, it it has not played out in that negative way. So do I think this will work in terms of stimulating the economy and plugging some holes that still exist from the pandemic in terms of economic employment, all that? Yes. Will there be unintended consequences? I'm open to that discussion and I'm not here to say no, there won't be. Um, I'm just answering the question directly that due to the pandemic a year ago, will this help continue to grease the wheels of the economy? I think it's pretty obvious. The answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I, I look at it the same way. Like we we throw a bunch of money at it, and that definitely just the way our economy works. I mean, that's the it's literally the currency of of what makes things go. And so by boosting that, as you pointed out, the 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 opposite lesson was learned from the depression. And so almost anytime these issues come up now, 
there we do the opposite of what happened then to prevent that type of outcome. And yes, there could be other consequences of this unintended consequences or things that we can reasonably foresee. But the immediate crisis requires some action is what the the, the people who study this time, this all the time say, you know, like the economists and so forth are looking at this and saying, hey, you got to do something. I think that this one also does a lot for from a people standpoint as well. Uh, the focus of some of the earlier stimulus a lot of times seem to be on direct support to business, which is good. You know, like I'm, I'm not here to, to, to really try to meet out every little thing, every little thing that was done. I think that by and large, you need to try to make something happen in this type of situation. And fortunately, our government is in position to try to make so, to make something happen in that sense. But this seems to be, there, there seems to be a lot of emphasis here on getting money to people. And that's, I mean, we've talked about that before. That's the easiest way to stimulate the economy is like, hey, give everybody 50 bucks or not 50 bucks. But I think when, when H or George W. Bush was in office, we, they gave everybody 600 bucks and they wanted to stimulate and that, Everybody goes and spends that money. And so here, you know, the, the, there's larger checks. There was some fighting over how much money you should be able to make in order to, to get that. Uh, but ultimately, they're sending money directly to people. They're making sure that uh, to keep try to keep things in place from a you know eviction standpoint or the unemployment standpoint. So it all seems like the like if you're checking a bunch of boxes that the economists say that we need to be looking at, it seems like they're checking all those boxes. Uh, ultimately, the, the fact that we're on our third one makes me wonder, <laughs> are we going to see a fourth or are we going to see a fifth? And, and not something will. like it's a these I look at these as more of necessity than like these aren't luxury. So, you know, it, it's not commenting on whether there should or shouldn't be. But at a certain point, I always like to look at things from a sustainability standpoint. And this isn't necessarily a sustainable way to run an economy. So at some point, I hope we have a plan to transition back to not requiring government stimulus, which I don't know that we were really there before the pandemic hit. You know, we were borrowing trillions of dollars every year before the, the pandemic hit. So I hope there's some thought going right now. We shouldn't wait for that to happen in order to try to figure out how to stim or how to transition out of this. But ultimately, yeah, I think it's going to work for its intended purpose. And as with anything, doing nothing would have created un unintended consequences and consequences that are foreseeable. This will create con consequences that are foreseeable and unintended consequences. And we'll deal with those then. I mean, that's why the government didn't, didn't just do this and just say, okay, we're done. And, you know, we'll see you in four years. You know, they got It's an ongoing obligation to see what's going on and to be able to react to it. Yeah, no, and you make a good point about uh, the pre-pandemic uh, economic and financial, I guess, ecosystem that we have uh, uh wound our way into as a nation and I think as a globe because, you know, we, we the, no one ever thought they would ever see negative interest rates. Like almost yeah. like, what does that mean? The bank is paying you to hold the money or something? But, <laughs> but we've had for years um, since the middle of, of the last decade, uh, negative interest rates in Europe for many countries and so in the European uh, Union. So, so you know, it's not just us that are printing money and that have kind of gone to this, uh, what has been touted as quantitative easing in the uh, economic circles uh, since the great financial crisis seems like most major economies in the world have done that. Um, Asian economies, European economies, and the American economies. So that's one thing that you're absolutely right on. And that's where stimulus is, is also kind of fudged over a bit because as, as a society, you know, we're unfortunately driven uh, by the media in our country. Um, and I say that as a broad term, including internet and all that. And so we always hear about these stimulative plans when they're like being legislated on like the one time, like you said yeah. about, you know, we've had three or so maybe since the pandemic, there'll probably be another one at some point this year. But what we don't hear about are the, the regular ongoing uh, stimulative effects that have been going on since the great financial crisis. So, yeah. for example, quantitative easing, the Federal Reserve never stopped that. Um, <laughs> up before the pandemic, they were still uh, buying $85 billion worth of debt, uh, you know, basically stimulating the economy, so to yeah. speak, to the tune of about $85 billion a month. So that's still about a trillion dollars a year prior to the pandemic that was getting pumped into the economy by the Federal Reserve as a way to, to keep everything stimulative. So I do think you're right that the train has left the station in terms of um, proper Keynesian economics being followed. Yeah. If we if we can say that we live in a Keynesian 
philosophy style system over the last hundred years. That's a whole different conversation than I think, you know, we, we prepared to get into today, which I think would be fun for us to game out in the future. Yeah. Um, but I would say going back to this particular stimulus, what I find interesting now, and I know we're going to get into this shortly, is really what these two, the CARES Act from last year and now this one under Biden represents also the philosophy of both parties in the United States, Republicans and Democrats. I would say from the 30,000 foot level of each party. I know that there's individuals within these parties who may think a little bit different or, mm-hmm. or see the need to see the other side's point a little bit more than others. But what I think uh, lends back to what you just alluded to about money going to the people, because I think that what happened is last year with the PPP loans and the EDA loans and all that type of stimulus, a lot of people felt that businesses got bailed out but kind of the little guy on the street, you know, the main street person didn't get bailed out. Or, or just didn't, didn't get, get as much, I think. Because yeah, there was they went like twelve hundred dollar checks, but it was there was a lot that went into to the business. Yeah, and part. I think and, and that's why I said it, it really comes down to the ideology and philosophy of both parties. So, you know, traditionally in the modern era, I would say our lifetimes, right? The last forty plus years, the Republican Party has been a party that feels that, you know, goes back from Reaganomics and trickle down economics, right? That if you um, promote businesses, you know, the whole idea that they will stimulate the economy, cutting taxes stimulates the economy, all that kind of stuff. And that'll find its way down. That's why the term is trickle down economics to the guy on Main Street at some point. Democrats. Yeah, somebody believe, has to build those yachts, right? Yeah. But <laughs> de- that's why, to me, I'm just going on philosophy. And I'm not trying yeah, to argue yeah, no, I what's I, one or r- I right resist. or wrong. It's, <laughs> Because it's, um, no, I know you couldn't. That's why I'm keeping (laughs) us focused. Um, Now, because the thing is, I think people need to understand where the philosophies come from. And this is why it's a perpetual argument, because it's really um, just a belief system, right? You either believe that, you believe that businesses, you know, will will help the economy if you give them the money, or you believe the other way, which is more the democratic way to think is, no, let's bypass the businesses and give the money directly to the people because they need it, number one. And number two, they'll spend the money, which will then go to the businesses through, through yeah. consumption. It's so, like a trickle up. It's, it's, it's kind right. of the, And you're right. It's, it's I, I do want to ask you because you, know, you brought the, the politics angle into this. And I, I think there's an interesting angle there. Uh, we saw a lot of polls that indicated like around two thirds of Americans. Some showed a little over that, you know, in the 70 percent or some in the 60 percent range that supported the stimulus. And at the same time, we know that zero Republicans in Congress voted for it. Now, obviously, you know, popularity does not necessarily correlate to virtue when it comes to these things. But the stimulus also appeared to be, you know, broadly supported by economists, you know, particularly ones that tried to not be partisan about things like this. So are the Republicans here seeing something that everyone else is missing? Because just on the in, in contrast with the CARES Act, yes, there was a lot of debate about it, a lot of talk about it, a lot of people objecting to this and that. But you did have lots of Democrats that actually ended up voting for it. And so zero is really the if it was 10, you know, 10 percent of Republicans or something, that's like, OK, yeah, they by and large disagree. But, you know, zero is that's a lot of solidarity standing <laughs> against this. You know, so are they seeing something that everybody's missing or, you know, was, you, is, was that is that like a political move? Is, is that political advantage they're shooting for by everyone in solidarity voting against something like this? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd, I'd, I'd say uh, I'll start with the second uh, question as my first answer, which is, yes, I think there's a huge amount of politics involved. Um, and I think that goes back to then the first question. Are they seeing something? I mean, I can't answer that directly because I'm not in Congress or Senate, you know, making these decisions. But. Conceivably, they would, could be would, seeing something political also. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. I, I think oh, they see sorry the for 20, stealing your yeah, thunder. You stole the thunder. <laughs> Let me go. Now, but I think that they are seeing the 2022 midterms, the 2024 uh, general election for the next president. And I think they're making, you know, a political calculation that, they, that has been successful for them for some time now, for the last couple decades, um, and especially over the last 12 years, is, is um, that if they obstruct and they... They they get because the way that the ecosystem of uh, our media is now, they understand that their base will not really get information directly from Democrats. They're not going to, you know, Democrats aren't getting asked to be do extensive interviews on Fox News or um, I know, unfortunately, you know, for for um, a lot of conservatives, Rush Limbaugh just passed. 
Um, so whoever the equivalent of, you know, the, the talk radio folks and all that, you know, they're not they're not inviting Democrats to, to, to hear their side and their opinion. So I think the, the Republicans have made the accurate political calculation, if I can say it that way, that by posturing as obstructing a lot. What happens is that their constituent and their voters will then like believe that there is something wrong with what the Democrats are offering. Mm-hmm. And that's actually more of a psychological play because yeah. it's not about is there something wrong or not with what the def- Democrats are offering? Because I'm sure that's, you know, one can make a fair argument on, on both ways on that. Well, you could probably uh, say there's some good and there's some bad. I mean, yeah, regardless it, of I think but if, if your you point, are, though, I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump back in your point would actually explain how you get 100 percent solidarity. Like that's the thing that really stands out there is like zero. Really? Like and that would lend to the idea of, yeah, we all have to be against this because then that fits this narrative that we're going to tell unrefuted in our e- media ecosystem. Correct. And, and it works. That's why it's, it is effective. That's why I said it's an effective political strategy, whether it's a, a nice one, whether it's one that, you know, helps effective a democracy out. <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. Whether it is a productive one for a democracy to always be obstructionist, I'm not here to judge that. I'm just saying, but it works not because- initial. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, they, they obviously maintain their position. So my point is, is that they're, they're, and I think it also speaks to the psychology again of, you know, Democrats don't seem to fall in line the same way that Republicans do, and that's not a political statement. It's, it's, and no, it, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Observed. Yeah. Howard yeah. Dean used to say it's like herding cats. Yeah, and and <laughs> but here's the other thing too, because I could see. Imagine if the Democrats on mass held up the stimulus last year, March of 2020. Which from like, a political standpoint, by the way, like that was an election year. Yeah. You know, like that would have been a significant thing. And there were people talking about that. I remember hearing like, oh, well, should we even be supporting this? Because, no, but I, you know, I think it's, it's just help. a different makeup of psychology of, of their two constituencies in today's modern world. And that's why I'm not bringing up Democrats from the 1950s or Republicans from the 1800s. I'm just saying that in politics today, in the 21st century right now so far, had Democrats zero come out for the stimulus, data suffered worse, right? Because there's a lot of Democrats that supported the stimulus and would have got upset at their own party. And then Republicans would have hated them anyway, no matter what they do. <laughs> Whereas with the Republicans, they have a much they have a much better way of bringing their electorate and their base over to the politicians' views, because this yeah. is what we're seeing now. Two weeks ago, 60% of Republicans polled supported the stimulus. That number's already cut in half. Yeah. Because of the ecosystem, because the yeah. political class through corporate media and the internet as well has done a great job of convincing their voters that this isn't good anymore because it was offered by a Democrat. Yeah. Even though it has a lot of goodies that would help people, not me and you, we're not getting a stimulus because we make too much income. Um, but it would help a lot of constituents in red states. I, I read in pre- preparation for today's show, seven out of the eight poorest states in the United States are Republican-controlled states. They have Republican governors and senators and this and that, and, and state legislatures dominated by Republicans. So their own constituents would benefit from a lot of the stuff in the stimulus, but they've been convinced not to, you know, not to believe it's that- a bad thing. That it's a bad thing. And also, I think it's, it goes back to something our, our, our good friend and partner on the other platform, Rob, once said, Rob Richardson, that they've been conditioned not to trust the messenger. You know, I think that when you look at this, I do believe it was a political calculation, first and foremost. And I did compare this to during an election year in 2020, the Democrats did vote for the CARES Act. And, you know, it wasn't just we have to oppose this because we can't let Donald Trump or or this you know Republican controlled Senate take credit for doing something good for people, uh, and, but I also think interestingly enough that the different parties their their voters have different expectations of their leadership, and I do agree with the Democrats would have paid if they wouldn't have supported that, and the reason being is that in, by and large now this is an overgeneralization, but there's truth in it that I think helps explain a lot of these things. Um, Democratic voters expect their leadership. To, make th- to do things to make their lives better, whereas Republican voters, a lot of times, not all the times, but a lot of times, look to their leadership to own the libs or to prevent the libs from making doing things that they're not going to like and so forth. And so 
as long as the Republicans are blocking the Democrats from doing things that Republicans, quote unquote, don't like, then they're, they're satisfied with their leadership. They're saying, OK, you guys, that's what we have you guys there for is to make sure that the libs don't do things. Whereas the Democrats, they don't put their voters in there to necessarily stop. The Republicans stop them from this, stop them from that. It's like, hey, we want minimum wage increase. We want this and that. And so it, for real things and, and things that I would think would make people's lives better. But so if you're coming from a place of, hey, what I'm in office for is to own the libs, to make sure that they don't force this down my throat or do all this deficit spending, even though I'm OK with you doing deficit spending, if you're doing it, you the Republican, but we just have to stop the Democrats from doing it then I, I, don't, I just don't think that the expectation is there to where they would be disappointed that it's not going to be, well, I put you in office. How come you didn't make it easier for me to deal with this pandemic? Because that's not what they're there for in the first place. Yeah, no. And, and, and I think it's also, you're right about all that. Uh, that's why I'll say and, and not a but. Um, it's, it's, it's also like, like I said, it's ideology. I don't even want to say it's conditioning because you know people do believe this stuff, whether it is good for them directly or not might be a whole different <laughs> argument. But I'll give you a quote because uh, Ted Cruz on February 26 was, you know, talking to his supporters and all that. And I'm going to quote what he said. He said, uh, the GOP is the party of steel workers and construction workers and pipeline workers and taxi cab drivers and cops and firefighters and waiters and waitresses and the men and women with calluses on their hands who are working for this country. Now, he's not wrong. There's a lot of people that fit that those job descriptions and have calluses on their hand that vote Republican. But then he voted no on the, on the stimulus, which would give them, you know, the, the, the extra money, you know, stimulus money immediately that helps with unemployment benefits. When a lot of these people, steel workers, construction workers, pipeline workers, you know, cabs, taxi cab drivers, cops, firefighters, they're all on the front line, waiters, waitresses. They're the yeah. ones, waiters, waitresses, the ones without jobs for a while. And, and also they're not the ones that benefited from the huge tax cuts they went through in 2017. Or the PPP loans, because they're usually <laughs> not the owners of the business. So my point is, is that that's where I think Democrats also don't like they get frustrated when they see this kind of behavior by someone like Ted Cruz, because they look at it that Ted Cruz is just being sinister, that he's a typical like it's funny that everybody hates politicians. So the right hates liberal politicians. But then this is where the left looks at someone like Cruz and say, you're hypocritical because your wife works at Goldman Sachs. You're Princeton and, and Yale educated. You know, I mean, you're acting like, you know, that 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 you want to help these people, but you're voting against their interests. But that's what I mean. Ted Cruz might have an honest ideology where he just feels that if you take care of the upper class and the business community, that it will trickle down magically to these workers. Or, I mean, um, and I've also seen the, the the mindset of if you do too much good stuff for people, you make them soft and unable to, to yeah, do Yeah, like McConnell's themselves. argument was with this stimulus was if we give them $1,400, they won't go to work. Yeah. Now, I know, you know, one and could that, say- And that, by the way, is by and large ideology as well. Correct. That's my um, point. That's pure yeah, ideology. Because yeah, we exactly. could sit here and game out the numbers that, okay, hmm, hold on. Someone making, uh, you know, let's say that I think it's married couples making under uh, six, 160 get $1,400. So if you're making 160 or 100,000 or 90,000, you know, chances are your expenses are going to be somewhat around that. Um, well, fourteen hundred isn't going to well, have. I don't you think we work. need to go into the numbers, though. But I mean, I, but more so because that's, that's my studied. point about proving its ideology, right? But no, it's, but it's, it, but that's been studied. Like yeah. I would say, the anecdotal recitation of it is much less persuasive. There's studies you can go look at out there and show that certain amount of there, there is a threshold. You know, like if you give everybody a hundred thousand dollars a year, then yeah. People no, of won't course. Work. Just like if but you tax if, everyone at ninety five percent, you know, no then nobody works. Work. So yeah. there's a so threshold. I get it. But yeah, there is at a below point. a certain threshold, then actually you create more entrepreneurship. You create more because people are less worried about not being able to eat if they take a slight risk. But it doesn't cut. It doesn't cut motivation of otherwise motivated people. And yeah, so but that's I why mean, I was going to say I think that it doesn't work this time because of everything we're talking about. Because I also think remember things are novel at one at some point and then it works. And after a while, you know, the public gets hip to it. So, But I mean, as long as they can control the message to their base, then you have to wonder. I mean, and that's, like I said, I think the points you're making are actually conflicting because somebody's got to tell the people that, hey, it's not playing out the way that you thought. Like even trickle down is a good example from an economic numbers standpoint. Nobody has ever been able to show that it worked. No, ever. Like any 
anytime you have econo- e- economists run the numbers, it, it, they cannot show that it worked. It, it looks like it doesn't work from a pure numbers standpoint. Uh, you end up having to borrow. You have to borrow like so Reagan borrows, George W. Bush borrows, Trump borrows, like all of them end up borrowing money. You know, Bush comes in with a with with a, a budget surplus, leaves or well, you know, forget the the the, the financial crisis, but turns yeah. that into a deficit before yeah. the financial crisis. So, oh, but it, but that's not common knowledge amongst people that are Democrats or Republicans that it's always shown to not work every time that somebody's tried to do it. So, the control who who controls the message matters. And then I'd say if you want to look broader, looking at the big picture. Over the past few years, we've seen the Republican Party routinely take positions that are opposed to meaningful majorities of Americans, and including like basic gun control, repealing Obamacare, you know, corporate tax cuts, privatizing Social Security and so forth. Like they, they constantly take these positions that the majority of Americans don't like. And we've seen them directly work or excuse me, a, a part of that, which could be related or could be a result of or something. But I think it's worth mentioning for the purposes of this conversation. We see them engage in a lot of work and activity that works to change laws to make it harder to vote or they, they engaging in voter suppression, gerrymandering districts uh, so that majorities of voters aren't needed for legislative majorities. Like what happens in, in Wisconsin is amazing. Like, Fifty percent of the voters will not get you half of the legislative uh, uh, of control of the legislature because it's just the way the districts are set up. You know, it's amazing how how if you want to put it this way, how well done the gerrymandering was done there. Uh, and you know, so like, are we missing the bigger picture here? Has there been either strategic or because of built-in factors like the Senate, the Senate, and the Electoral College, or both, some fundamental change of the necessity for popular support? you know, for, for wielding power. Well, no, for obtaining I think power. It's a good question because I think that um, it's all part of that smoke and mirrors part of life. You know, like it's kind of like, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing like my health, right? Yeah. I, 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 I unfortunately lost a close friend of mine a few months ago to a massive heart attack, died on the spot. But you realize that doesn't just start like he didn't just start having, let's say uh, uh, deposits on his artery the night before. Yeah. There was, was a long time, probably, unfortunately, you know, years of buildup inside his body. And then at some point it just was too much and, 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 you know, it ended his life. And I think that's the way we look at it, right? Like, are we missing the bigger picture? And I think as a society, probably yes. But what I mean is everybody likes the idea of acting like we're, you know, not we personally as Americans, but this idea that any society that we're in is somewhat free and that we have a democracy and all that. And it goes back to even like this, this idea of socialism, like somehow, you know, that we're going to have socialism in the United States. And people don't realize before the Affordable Care Act, 46 cents out of every dollar spent on healthcare in the United States was spent by the federal government in some capacity. Yep. Medicare, Medicaid, veterans benefits. Yep. That made up 46%. And then, and then subsidies. Yep. When, you know, hospital districts were failing or something like that, the government still steps in and pays for them. And so, the subsidies oftentimes are done at the least efficient time. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The most that, amount of money for the least amount of services. But go ahead. But, but, but we put up with these inefficiencies because it makes us feel good. Because yeah. then we don't have to feel like we're a socialist country or something, even though we halfway are. I think you're onto something from a, a feel standpoint. Like we want to feel like our democracy functions in a certain way that our republic as far as you know majority rules within the constructs constraints of, of the constitution but you know it, it we want to feel like all that stuff is really operational but it does seem like that our system so to speak has been hacked and not hacked i don't say, I say that not in a malicious way i say that in a way of op, of of optimization basically that it's been optimized in, in in terms of an approach way where the aim doesn't even have to be to say more people agree with me than agree with you. Yeah, I can wield power. I can uh, gather and wield power in ways that don't require me to have the, 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 the will of the people, so to speak, behind me. I don't have to have 51% or 55%. I can have 40% of the people backing me, but because I know how to play the, the rules of the game well or... To the other point, if I manipulate the rules in a certain way, then I can ultimately have the end game being power, you know, the end game power. And yeah. it seems like we're kind of not seeing that this is happening right now, uh, you know, because like I said, I, I'm looking at it just from the standpoint like, wow, I'm surprised that 
it, that a, polit- a major political party, one of two major political parties, has, is routinely taking these positions that it's like, well, man, I would think well, that if you routinely took positions that 40, only 40% of the people liked, that of ultimately you would pay the price. But maybe they've maybe they're looking at this in a galaxy brain way that we aren't seeing yet. Like, well, no, no, well that's we why I think that's why we have so many culture wars. That's why we got to hear about Dr. Seuss and about other things that distract most of the public from looking at these kind of things, right? And 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 then it becomes an you emotional distract. Thing. Let me just say this. You just say distract. Distract assumes that most of a public wants to look at this type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It gets into the most reality of human beings are emotional. And you're right. I mean, look, we got 300 million people in this country. There's all kind of different mindsets and brain chemistries and all that. And, and how right. many majority people really of, want to talk about tax code or how many people really want to talk about the way things should be governed? But the unique thing we have, and that's what I was going to say, it's, it's, a, um, it's a manipulation of things that are already here and then a manipulation of, I guess, uh, well, let me restate that. Like you said about the word hack, this isn't like something that just happened five years ago or 10 years ago and all of a sudden one party just decided, hey, let's just figure this out and, and do it. And what, we're say, what I'm saying is, Things that have already been in place, like the Electoral College, for example, mm-hmm. like um, congressional districts and the ability to to redraw the maps every 10 years with a census. Mm-hmm. Those are things that have been in this country since its founding. Yeah. And they're they're, not, they're not necessarily bad things on their own, but what happens is they get manipulated into gerrymandered districts yeah. or into like we've been talking about, right? You've got now 50 senators on either. This is why it's a very interesting time to have this conversation. Because of the population makeup and where people are located, we have 50 Republican senators who represent around 140 million Americans and 50 Democratic senators, which represent around 185 million Americans. Yeah. So you have an equal division of power that is shared in the government, you know, the equal branch of power with the executive right now. But yet you've got 40 million more Americans that actually supported one ideology and one side than another. And I think... And you that know, actually is the design of the Senate. Yeah, that's you what know, I'm like it was set up like that, that to do that. In a way, I I appreciate that because I think that it forces uh, any large society to have to deal with a minority, which is good, um, no matter who they are, that they should be respected and have their voices heard. But I think what we've seen in the um, in the last probably 20 years, um, because of the parlor tricks and the chess games that you know by the politicians, it's unfortunately also caused us to really gum up the works. Well, it's, and, it's intended um, to to, to pro- provide balance between urban and rural, like that's and that goes back, you know, to the beginning. Now there was yeah. also the the factor of slavery there. Yeah, but that's messy right now. If, if but if no, I'm just I just we don't even go there. It's um, but no, you know, so, I just wanted to, to you, you said minority, but really it, it's urban and rural balance is what the Senate is supposed to, to Senate is supposed to provide, and then same thing with the Electoral College. And yes, there there is a virtue in that. And the fact that it has like kind of you, you see how that can be weaponized in ways where, hey, we don't have to convince people anymore. We can just kind of tailor these things. If you look at that, if you look at the, the redistricting process, those are all things that are in place. If you, Now, when you go to voter suppression and things like that, that's kind of a little more sinister and more uh, a direct opposition to kind of the creed of the country. But it's also stuff that's existed you know, for no, a long but time. Here's as the well. thing what's interesting about today's world. Everybody likes the idea of being in a democracy. But we have a certain group of Americans now that if it if it's not exactly how they think it should be and the people that they think should be in power, they're okay giving up the Come ability for, to have their fellow citizens vote freely. Yeah. And that's what I mean that until 2020, we never saw it so glaring and so obvious. And I think it culminated with the insurrection, right? Like yeah. This many people felt that strongly that this election was stolen. And we could sit here and blame the politicians that that kept playing this game after the election and all that. But in reality, each of these people that, that believes this has a responsibility themselves. And that goes back to your point, right? All the evidence out there still doesn't convince them. And forget the media. Just the fact that courts that are judges appointed by Donald Trump and then the Supreme Court, which is now as tilted as it's ever been conservative in our lifetime, they all shut down these election fraud claims as well. You've got the president, the former president on tape, trying to be like a mafia don, trying to strong arm, you know, the state uh, people in Georgia and all that to find votes. None of that matters. That's what I'm saying, that part of it is the politician, but part of it is this many American, our fellow Americans actually are okay with giving up democracy if it doesn't look like how they want it to look. And that's, that's something that I didn't realize prior to this era, this last few years. 
that given the opportunity, and, and these are things we would hear like in history class, right? Oh, democracies aren't easy to keep, you know, going and all that. I never really understood that until now. No, I mean, it, it's definitely, we see this. And I think a lot of times when you're so close to things, it's hard to take a step back and look at kind of from a big picture trajectory standpoint, what exactly is happening. And so I, that, it, I thought it was worthwhile to take a look at that in this instance, because it does seem to be common where, and it's one thing to take unpopular positions from the standpoint of individual liberty, like, hey, let's not have slaves anymore. You know, as far as, you know, the inalienable rights, you know, the, the human beings and so forth. But it's another thing to take unpopular positions as far as just matters of just mere governance, you know, like the whether or not you should have to have a background check for a firearm is not something of, of someone's humanity. You know, that's just a question of for a society to figure out. And what, what do people, what do the, what do the members of society think about that? And if, you know, however that comes out, that's a lot of times how that society should, should play that out. You know, again, it's not talking about taking all firearms away from people, but just, you know, the, how we want to administrate things versus how we're actually going to treat people as human beings. So, I, I, I'm glad that we took a second to kind of just try to take a step back and look at this from a big picture. One other thing uh, that we wanted to look at, and again, it's kind of it, it's a little bit of a big picture thing, but it's something we we do kind of every year, or at least in in, you know, in large part in, in this country, and that's daylight savings time. But there's rarely an evaluation of what are we doing here, like, or why are we doing this, or does this actually even accomplish the goals that it, it set out to accomplish, and so forth? Could we do things any better? Because it's 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 a disruption in everybody's lives, and we just had it here. Uh, you know, we're both in the East Coast. We just sprung forward uh, yesterday, and so I sent you something. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking about the science behind uh, daylight savings time, and you know whether or not it's something we should be continuing to do, why we have it and what, whether, you know, we should continue to do it. Was any, did anything stand, stand out to you in that as far as uh, just what we're doing here, saving daylight? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, not, I mean, I know we'll be short here. Not really. I'm, I'm one of these people that agrees that it's probably time to just cancel it and have just one time set forever. Uh, the other thing I found with learning reading here that um, I guess Arizona doesn't have any daylight savings time. Yeah. Well, so, several like, states, Florida was one of the states that's passed, yeah. like trying to get rid of it, but yeah. they need federal approval. And so there's, it seems to be a big, but it's movement. just, that's what I mean. Like that's the, where it's just, I mean, how are we going to have, like, let's say we're on the, you know, Georgia is the state that borders us. Um, I mean, imagine being close to that border and like, you got a job across the border or something. It's like a different time and well, to just that, too sloppy. Not, like that, there's parts of Florida that are in central time, man. So you can't look at it yeah. solely like that. You know, well, no, most this, of Florida's in, in, in Eastern time and then part of the panhandle's in Central time as you get close to, to well, Alabama. No, I thought it ends as you cross the border to Alabama, it goes to Central time. But that's my point anyway, right? It doesn't like whether it's in your home state of Ohio, I know is is, is, is Central and in Pennsylvania's East Coast. So my point is, I think no, all that no, doesn't make Ohio's sense. Ohio's is, is Eastern time as well. Okay, well, then the next day, next to you. But that's my point. None of it makes sense. I think we just should it's just- It's arbitrary. It's arbitrary. One, one time and, and, and let it alone and then- we know that the seasons give us a little bit more daylight or, 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 or not, you know, depending whether it's winter or summer anyway. So I don't think we need to, you know, uh, supercharge it with, with setting the clock an hour back or forth. Um, well, yeah, and Hawaii doesn't have the, the daylight savings. Well, it doesn't have the time change because, because they're further south. Their daylight and they, they don't have as much variation in the seasons as far as – because, you know, like one of the things as far as just the Earth's tilt is that – it, when you're close to closer to the equator, you have less variation in terms of day day to day sunrise and sunset across the seasons. Whereas the closer you are to the poles, the more variation you have, which is why somewhere like in, in Alaska, you'll have so much variation that in the summertime you might have 23 hours of daylight, and in the wintertime you might have 23 hours of, of nighttime at various points. So, trying to account for all that, I think that the daylight savings time change is something like I I, I think it's probably we're at a point now where we can just figure out is there a good way to do it from an empirical standpoint, and then just do that. I don't know that we need to hold on to this because it, it's already in place. If it's One of the things that stood out to me in this was just that th they asked the question, is daylight savings time dangerous? Meaning by adjusting the time of evening when it actually either going to it or coming out of it, adjusting the time of evening when, we, we, it, when it gets dark based on the time change, 
you know, think of people find it driving becomes more dangerous when it becomes if we adjust the time to make it darker in the evenings. Um, people ask the question if, if there's more like robberies or things like that, or mm-hmm. just people walking around. They, like uh, you don't think about it from that standpoint, but conceivably, maybe we should just try to figure out, well, how can we have as much time? in the evenings, in daylight, in each of the time zones, and just set it, set the time based on that, it would make sense. That said, I don't think that it's some grand crime against humanity that we do daylight savings time. It's a disruption. It affects you for a couple of times or a couple of days each year, meaning the, the day, the immediate day after, and maybe another day, and then you kind of, your body <laughs> adjusts. But either way, it's just one of, it's a, it's a really like, so many things that we do every day that you never ask why we do them. And this is societal. And then, yeah, the other thing that stood out to me on this was that there's a bunch of states that are like, yo, we're trying to get rid of this. And the federal government's kind of like dragging its feet. And I'm like, <laughs> so I wonder, you know, like, is this a political issue? Are there like, <laughs> are there like people that are like, yo, I, I, you're, I'm not giving you any donations if you guys change daylight savings time for this reason? Or are we going to end up with some villain of daylight savings time? Like, so it, do we need the other normal political stuff come in? Because I, I, it surprises me that you know, all of the time stuff is relatively arbitrary when you get to the borders of, you know, what, here's this time zone, here's that time zone, or here's, you know, daylight savings time or not. So I don't know. I, those are the things that kind of stood out to me and just questions that we don't ask. And hey, I'm all in favor of the government trying to come up with with wins that they can deliver on. And if this is one we could just, hey, we, we're going to make everybody's lives but life better. We're going to do this. Then they should be doing it. Because there's a lot of hard questions. There's a lot of consequential things that we have to deal with. Maybe this is an easy one. Deal with it. Make make think make things better, and then we move on. And and, and forty percent of the people are happy. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny that um, it's funny that just to wrap it up. I felt the same thing reading it. This it's funny. This is probably the lightest topic we've done in our whole career of our podcast together. Um, but it also made me just realize how like norms become in a society that we just. We've all just accepted this. We're born into this system of daylight savings. And and I think to your point about why it doesn't get changed, I think it actually makes me think it, it's such a non-big deal, I think, to most of us that it just it's, it's like um, when you procrastinate, you know, doing your dishes or something, you know, it's just like, like, I'm sure if we just as a nation decided to focus on this topic, we'd get it done in a couple of months. Congress would legislate it out and everyone would agree that, you know, the majority of Americans would agree, yeah, I'm OK not having this anymore. Yeah, but I just think it's like you said. There's a lot of other issues we got to 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 talk and negotiate and worry about. Hey, but so some, this, if you can get some easy wins, like in this, they laid out even with some graphs as far as if they if you actually took daylight savings time and made it all year round, like so that would just be our our time basically. We shift our time, the time zone every each time zone we shift it an hour and just keep it like that. You end up with every everywhere basically in the continental United States. You know, most of the time. You get daylight that extends past 5 p.m., which, you know, is deemed to be worthwhile as far as, you know, again, commuting and, you know, like keeping it light longer. In no, the I get afternoon. it. I'm just saying that it's just like it's like one of those topics. I think that no one like who's going to be the one or me and you going to be there. All right, let's create a pack. Let's go. Let, you know, let's go hammer our congressman about this. You know, like like everyone's got such bigger fish well, to it fry. It won't be me and you, man, because Florida's already said they want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> they already passed something with it. So now we got no, but now we got to hammer the federal government to let Florida do it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but no, just the idea that that, yeah, everyone else has a bigger issue when they get to, you know, when you get that that that. That that moment in the sun to talk to a politician is probably not daylight savings that's on their mind. <laughs> that's all I'm saying is that I just and think also, it's one of those. I guess nobody's going to run in, in you know two years. That's or four what I mean. Years, like, like hey, yeah. I was the one that got you guys yeah. daylight savings. That's like, time like yeah, that. I'm going to run for Congress or Senate. My platform is going to be daylight savings with every <laughs> other thing going on around the world. You know, hey, you know what's you funny? Know what? That might be make the guy our that wins. Work better though. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Like nowadays, people are running saying, "Hey, I'm going to protect you from these your fellow Americans." Like that's probably a, a more negative approach than you know just saying. Yeah, hey. but the sad part is it works. So that's what tells you what people want to hear too. You know? <laughs> they don't want to hear about daylight savings and stuff that everyone will agree on. Yeah, that's nobody will take you seriously. I bet you 95 percent of people would agree. Like, yeah, let's get rid of that. That sucks. But you're right. Like nobody wants to. Everyone wants conflict, man. That's what sells. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I things guess. like daylight savings, unfortunately, get left to the sideline. Well, at, at some point, but like at, at a certain point, Congress did weigh in on it and take their time to, to put it in place, you know, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely. Uh, it, Watch, it, it, you know what it'll be? I'm going to start a company. I'm going to be like Warren Buffett that I'm going to now have. I'll have to live to like, like 95. 
because I'm not worth a billion yet. So it's going to take me a few decades to get there, you know, but I'm just going to get to one of these wealthy, wealthy political donors. And I'm going to just for shits and giggles, make that my issue. Make that your issue. I'm just, and I'm going to be like, look, it's going to make business run smoother, all that. And then you just start lobbying slowly. And then that'll be me. Like my accomplishment as some old man. You like, threw some, I mean, no, I got you them threw to some money this. behind it. You wouldn't need a billion dollars because nobody would be opposing you. You know, or maybe they would. Maybe every, everybody would make you out to be a, a, an evil person because you you want to extend daylight savings time or anything like that. But again, uh, yeah, it, it just it seems like sometimes the focus it, it, it grinds to a halt a lot of times if your focus is always on trying to hit home runs about everything. Yeah, and so there seem to be when you look at this, it seems to be tangible benefits that could be obtained from trying to deal with this in, in a way, but that it it we we deem it. As, I mean, we're laughing about it. We deem it as too trivial for us to even consider it. Just says yeah. something, you know, it just says something about, I mean, this is self-governance, you know, like, and so maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't care, you know, like, but ultimately everything that our government should do, if everything we're only, if the only thing we want them to do are deal with the most consequential issues of our time, then we are going to see more gridlock because there's so much rigidity in those those consequential issues where some these, these are issues where you might be able to establish some working relationships you address something it, it it you see two years later it works you know productivity is up you know or something like that or at car accidents are down or you know whatever so i don't know it, it, it's it was worth taking a quick look at you know i don't want to belabor the point you know so i think we can wrap this up from here uh we we definitely appreciate everybody for joining us uh, as we meandered through <laughs> the stimulus and and the the just the big picture operations of our government with something like that and some other things uh, and then also just you know just for a little bit of fun the daylight savings so until next time i'm james keys i'm tune there all right subscribe rate review tell us what you think and we'll talk to you next time